Bill and I are in New York because we're hosting an event called Goalkeepers, and it's really to show what's the progress that's happened on these UN Sustainable Development Goals that were, were set in 2015. And to talk about the fact that the world has made incredible progress, but that progress is not at all inevitable. And that's what struck me from the Goalkeepers Progress Report this year. Uh, you focus specifically on global health and on eliminating poverty. And you all have been very optimistic, where a lot of people think things have not gotten better. Mm. You've pointed out along the way that things have gotten better. But the line that really struck with me was that progress is possible, but not in inevitable. What, what did you see happen over the last year? Is there anything that caused you to think that or, or made you think, OK, we've got to be really alert on this? Sure. Well, as you said, uh, poverty has been cut in half as a world. Childhood deaths have been cut in half in the last 25 years. But we see this youth boom happening now in Africa. 60% of the population there is under the age of 25. And so if we invest in their health and their education, they'll lift up their economies. They have huge potential. They'll lift up the continent. But the converse could also happen. If we don't make those investments, you're going to see more HIV AIDS. You're going to be, see more deaths uh, than we've had before. So we need to keep our eye on the ball and make these investments as a world. What, what you all do at the foundation is huge work. It's important work. But I, I know that you also rely on government funding. If they're going to be making these massive goals, things like attacking malaria or trying to eradicate polio, those aren't things you can do by yourselves. Absolutely not. It's really important to know the role of philanthropy versus the role of government. We can take risks sometimes where a government can't. We can show what works. We can bring forward data. But then it's really government funding that has to really deal with huge numbers of vaccination or uh, HIV or investing in education. Quality education is a place the world really needs to focus. You know, we have seen a lot of governments mo more focused on trying to manage their own budgets mm. and be concerned about these issues. Is that why you're concerned about this? Do you think that governments may step back from some of these initiatives? I think that as a world, we sometimes think, oh, I've taken care of that issue already. The fact that number of childhood deaths are down or the fact that, okay, we've put all this funding into HIV AIDS. But we need to, what we need to say is that the world, the high income countries need to keep doing that. South Korea used to receive aid and then eventually it became a middle income country and then it was on its way and we stopped funding it and it now helps fund the rest of the world. But until some of these African nations move from low to middle income, we have to make these investments and continue to call on their governments to make the right investments in health and education. Melinda, I saw an interview that you did recently and you were asked if you had a magic wand what it would be that you would kind of wave and wave away or what you would do with that magic wand. And you had an interesting answer. You said you'd focus on reproductive health. Absolutely. Why? Because when women have access to contraceptives and they can choose when and if to have children, it completely changes their lives and it changes their families' lives. We know from great data all over the world now that once women can make that decision, she can lift her family out of poverty, literally. But conversely, if you don't give her that tool and you don't give her education about it and give her access, you keep her in a life of poverty. She's destined to a life of poverty. And so there are 214 million women asking us for the tools that we have here in the United States and in Europe, and we need to deliver them to them. You know, I thought a lot about that because the foundation is always kind of steered clear of anything controversial mm. because you are doing so much, you've got big goals, you need to ask for help for governments to do that. What, what actually brought you on your own personal journey to get to that point, to, to where you thought that this is so important? What did you see along the way? I met women all over the world. And when I would sit down and talk to them in their homes, in their villages, in a township, and really listen to them. I would often be there to talk about childhood vaccines and they'd answer my questions, but when I really gave them the chance to talk, they would say to me, what about that tool? What about that shot? They use a shot quite often in Africa for reproductive health. Why can't I get it? They were irate and they would say, look, I have five children. It's not fair to my youngest child for me to have another one. And so finally listening to the women and then coming back and looking at the data, I thought, you know, I can't just, I can't shy away from this issue. Somebody has to answer those cries and somebody has to rise above the politics and say, this is important. This has to be on the global health agenda. Was that a struggle for you personally? Because with your own background and upbringing, that wasn't necessarily something that, that you thought 
growing up, right? You bet. I'm Catholic. Yeah. And uh, I had many discussions with my family, my immediate family, my parents, my siblings. I had discussions with former priests and nuns. And at the end of the day, I decided I use these tools. I counsel all three of my children, my son and my two daughters, to use these tools to know about their bodies and know about them. And I thought, I have to follow my conscience. You know, women's babies are dying because they're coming too quickly. And the women's bodies, they can't sustain what's going on. How can I not answer those calls? So at the end of the day, I had to wrestle with my conscience. And my conscience says, this is the right thing to do. Let's talk a little bit about another initiative that I, I hadn't realized until very recently you were doing. Um, Pivotal is uh, Pivotal Ventures is mm. a venture capitalist, and you're involved in this. I didn't realize for the last several years you'd been looking to help fund companies that were alternatively led, maybe not led by white men who were out there. Mm. This is, um, again, something I didn't realize you were doing. How'd you get to this point? Yeah, so I founded a company called Pivotal Ventures in 2015. And really the point is, again, as I traveled the world, I had to ask myself, is there anywhere in the world that we have true equality for women? And the answer is no, <laughs> we just don't, not even in the United States. And so there are some gaps in particular in the United States that I wanted to help fill, separate from the foundation. And so I formed Pivotal Ventures. And one of the places I focus that company on is women in tech. Women are so underrepresented in the technology sector in the United States, and yet tech is pervasive. It is changing our lives. And so women have to be able to have their great ideas come forward, not just have a seat at the table, but have their great ideas come forward to help change society. Why do you think it is that only about 2% of VC funding goes to companies that are headed by women? I think... Um, that industry became a boys' network very early. Less than 8% of partners at VC funds are women um, at the partner level. And I don't know about you, but I think that's more um, a symptom of the funders, not the founders. And so the fact that less than 2% of funding goes to women's companies, that's crazy. Or less than 1% goes to a woman of color. And so we have to change that. And so I'm investing in, in people like Aspect Ventures or Defy Capital or Female Founders Fund, where their funds absolutely expect a return. I expect a good return, but they over-index for women's businesses. You know, there's been so much talk about this in California. There's a proposed uh, rule that would force companies to have a certain number of board members that are mm. women. Um, we talked about this with Sally Krawcheck recently, and she's not a fan of government legislation doing these things, but she said, that someday I might be, because nothing else seems to be working. Mm. What, what's your thought on this? Do you have a larger thought, or is this just, a, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is? I'm putting my money where my mouth is right now, but I'm watching that, and I'm collecting data from around the world, and I'm looking at it, because there are places that sometimes quotas make sense for a time to get things going. Um, uh, for instance, one of the countries that has the most number of women parliamentarians is Rwanda. It's because President Kagame came in and said, we will have at least 40 percent of women parliamentarians. They're way over that now. And so some of the places in Europe are looking at quotas for a time. And I don't know if that's right for the United States, but I know we need to do something to accelerate women in business. So what have you found at Pivotal so far? What, what have your investments done? What has your research shown you there? So one of my uh, pieces of research also shows me that we need to create new pathways for women into technology. Uh, that first opening computer science class at college is too late. Uh, we need to work there. There are things, there are great universities changing that class to make it accessible to women, changing things in high school um, so that women want to go into tech. They see role models. They know they can do it. So I see that. I also see that we have a workforce today, a workplace, I should say, today, that's not designed for families. And yet, if you interview most men and women around the United States, they have families. Yeah. So we need to have a good paid family medical leave policy. So if you have an elderly parent that needs care, you have a young child, you go out for pregnancy, you can come back to your career. Well, one of only eight countries in the world, in the world, that doesn't have a paid family leave policy. That's crazy. I, I, I don't know if everyone knows your background from before, where you went to Duke, mm -hmm. you went to the Fuqua School of Business, you worked at Microsoft and headed up a lot of initiatives there. Um, you've seen the corporate workplace. What was it, 1996 when you joined Microsoft? I joined actually in 1987. 1987. And I left in 96. Okay, left in 96. Yeah. 
So you've seen this for a long time. You have your own experiences that you can kind of fall back on. This is what women around the country are kind of watching right now in this Me Too movement. We see changes taking place. Do you think that this is taking place ac across corporate America? And where do you think we are on this journey? I think it's spotty right now. I think there are places where we are moving forward. And I think there will continue to be a pushback where there'll be places where people will try to roll back the progress. The thing that makes me optimistic, though, this time that's very different, if you interview women who are over 60 and then you interview young, younger women and you look at the generation in between, this younger generation is about bringing all women forward. There's a lot of guilt from women who are over 60s. They say, I made it, I assimilated, but I was kind of one of one. And I think everybody sees that we need to get better across society, government, corporations, founding businesses. It can't be just in one industry. We can't accept that less than 14% of women have paid family medical leave. We just can't accept that anymore. And so I'm starting to see everyone speak out and say, this is not right. And when something goes wrong, you see a cacophony of voices coming in saying, no, let's keep moving forward. You know, medical leave isn't just for women, it's for men no. too. And you start to see men taking more advantage of that and paternity leave too. Is that the pathway? It, it absolutely is the pathway. And we need to say to men, it's okay to go out and to take leave. Because one of the things is when a man takes a leave, he's more involved in raising the children. It's better for him and it's better for the kids. Women around the world do seven years of unpaid labor that their husbands don't do. In the United States, women do five years of unpaid labor their husbands don't do. We do 90 minutes more a day. You know, make the school lunch, help with the homework, fix the breakfast, drive them to school. We need to look at that and, and recognize women are working today. They're in the workforce. But we have to redistribute the workload at home. And paid family medical leave for men and women helps with that. You're a mom not only of two daughters, but also of a mm. son. How do you kind of look at them going out in the world? And, and, and what are your hopes? My hopes and dreams for my kids are that they reach their full potential and that anything they want to do, uh, they can do, and that they end up in an equal relationship. Mm -hmm. And I'm incredibly proud of them. Uh, my son allows me to call him a feminist. He believes in women having equality. My daughters believe in it, too. And um, I'm excited to see where they go in the world. Melinda, I want to thank you very much for your time. Melinda Gates, again, is the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation.